Did you know that in North Carolina, we have the barbecue capital of the world? Or at least that's what the over-enthusiastic residents like myself will tell you. Lexington, just east of Charlotte, is obsessed with pork. But in all the time that I lived there, I don't remember that many pigs running around. Twelve whole years, I never saw a living pig. But I definitely got my fill of pigs, and not from the barbecue I was eating. You see, you couldn't walk 10 feet downtown without seeing a pig statue. They'd go crazy over this. Every business went ham, trying to reimagine the pig through their own brand. And once a year, they'd reach the peak of it all, a barbecue festival to rival the 4th of July. Lots of barbecue and rides that made you squeal like the pigs you were eating. But despite all of these celebrations and statues, I never saw a real live pig. Likewise, we never talk about the cost of raising 9 million pigs in a state with only 10 million people. We have no substantial connection to the animal that almost outnumbers us. We're completely obsessed with celebrating its product, but we are blind to where and how it is produced. Speaking of which, if the pigs are not all in the barbecue town, where are they? Well, the pig farms are scattered across the state, but the majority of them are here in concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs for short. And with every CAFO comes a large pink hole in the ground with the waste and excrement of thousands of pigs. This is the unsightly, unseen, unspoken cost of hog production in North Carolina. Olympic swimming pools built in the 1980s that have spent the last 40 years open to the air and relatively untreated. The smell of them wafts down the countryside for miles. And after the waste has done its time in the hole, the farmers transport it to other agricultural operations nearby, spray it onto the crops, which aerosolizes it and puts even more of it into the air. Studies from Duke University have shown that the neighbors of these farms can face significant health issues, with many of them suffering from asthma, respiratory problems, and in some cases, a shorter life expectancy, all from the volatile organic compounds in the swine waste. Many of the neighborhoods surrounding these farms are very bitter towards them, because on hot, sunny days, they can't go outside because of the smell they can't eat their pork barbecue because of the flies from the pig farms. And in the worst cases, their houses are coated in excrement. These farming practices affect not only the neighbors of these farms, but also local public water supplies. You see, when the Hawkagoons flood, they can contaminate nearby water sources with antibiotic resistant bacteria can cause algal blooms and fish kills from the nitrogen and excess phosphorus. And they can also inoculate the water with the microbes from the hogs. And honestly, I don't really want to be drinking that. Do you? And although Hurricane Florence breached 50 plus lagoons and caused all of this waste to enter our coast, Although there have been over 25 lawsuits from Smithfield Foods, the main hog producer in North Carolina, because of the smell alone, and although over $50 million was invested by your state and Smithfield Foods in 2000 to research new technologies to combat this issue, nothing concrete was implemented, and it is still ongoing. When I first learned about all of this, I felt sickened 
by what was being allowed into the air and water of our state, and saddened, honestly, at what the neighbors of these farms were going through. And at the start of 2020, I decided to take action into how I could help fix this, but not in the same way that had always been done. Not through anger at the farmers, because the majority of them don't even own the pigs. They're just their stewards. Not through more lawsuits at Smithfield Foods, and not through chastising our government and our legislature for their negligence and apathy towards this problem. I decided I wanted to combat this issue by going right to the source, by contributing more research into academic, sustainable, and economic solutions to this problem. As a biological engineering student, with a passion for innovation and a love of the earth, this was something that I felt like I could do to help this issue. And NC State, the school that I go to, has given me access to opportunities, time, resources that these farmers simply don't have. The lack of development and access to proper waste management technologies is the main reason these problems still largely persist. And so I present to you the Pig and Pines Project, a research initiative that started in August 2020 that is based on trying to combat the pig problem with another waste. Pine bark. Pine bark caught my attention because pine trees are everywhere in North Carolina, just like swine. And I thought that they had a great potential to be an economic solution to this problem. Pine is locally raised, like swine, and using it as a solution keeps money here in the North Carolina agroeconomy. Pine is also readily available because pine is the most cultivated tree in North Carolina and pine bark is inexpensive as it is the waste product of the pine industry. This waste product can be a very valuable source of biomass, a carbon-rich renewable material that comes from plants and animals. Biomass is also considered a form of carbon storage because as the plant grows up, it pulls carbon dioxide out of the environment, puts it inside of itself, and uses that to grow. Biomass can be used for many things, including fuel and electricity generation. But in our lab and in my research project, we are looking at doing something different with it, turning it into biological charcoal, or biochar. Biochar is produced by burning biomass in an environment with no oxygen. After burning the pine biomass for three to four hours in an oven at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, all that is left behind is pure carbon. Additionally, the biochar is much more rough, bumpy, and full of holes than the pine bark it was made from. This transforms it from a block of carbon to a carbon sponge. The holes in the biochar serve to increase its surface area. This creates little tiny sites for the compounds from the air that we want to absorb to come and stick to. And this technology is actually found all around you, in your house and in everyday items, like a Brita pitcher and in aquarium filtration setups. The idea is simple. There is waste in the water. And biochar is an excellent sponge for that waste. Our proposed creation of biochar looks like this. First, we take the waste from the forestry industry and bring it into our lab. Then we do some chemistry on it, treat it with enzymes, and we end up creating a sugar byproduct in the process. Creating sugar like glucose from the pine bark is our way of making a byproduct that can be sold to generate more economic incentive for the industry to adopt this process. After the chemistry and enzymes are done with their job and the pine bark biomass has been thrown in the oven, it is then turned into biochar. We are currently testing this biochar for its potential to absorb volatile organic compounds from the air around the swine farms. It could also be used to lower the level of contaminants 
in the water, not just the volatile organic compounds. Because as the hog farms flood, they will take those contaminants with them. And so by using biochar to potentially pull them out, we are lessening the effect that the wastewater would have on nearby streams. My research believes that we can take this simple technology to the swine farms. And as far as its implementation, we are still in the theoretical phase of all of it. We are tentatively thinking to put the biochar in little mesh baggies, put it in the swine lagoon, let it float around and absorb the odor as compounds, remove it, wash the biochar, and then reuse it. But the larger idea of using what we already have from the forestry industry to clean up the mess in the swine industry started because we saw a chance to add even more value to our state's economic strong suits. There is so much innovation to be found from taking a problem in your own backyard and in relabeling an end product as a starting material. And my own story is just a simple case study. After growing up in the barbecue capital of the world, I became involved in waste management research to solve a problem that I had always been blind to. This just goes to show that when our culture idealizes something and celebrates it to such a degree, it tends to be human nature to be blind to the consequences that come with all of the wonderful things, to forget about the waste products that could be new beginnings. So I challenge you to go out and look at what you consider to be waste in your everyday lives. Do a little digging and see if you can find your own fresh perspectives. Thank you.